There was once a person that was a fairly good guy. He went to church, he participated, he had rather good grades, but he had one problem. And that was that he was addicted to something that would drain the life out of him. And as he would read the Bible, he would see all his defects and he would see his sins. But yet, he felt like he was like complete trash because he would keep on failing each time he tried to overcome. And he had asked God several times to help him, and God did his part, but he did not do his part of letting go the sin that he cherished, yet hated at the same time. You know, he felt miserable because he just would not be able to overcome it. He even thought that it might be best not to even try. Have you ever felt that way? You know, I bet most of you have. And, you know, um, it could be whatever. It could be like whatever that can be pushing you down. I don't have to know, but did you know that there is hope, friends? Hope, did you get that? I don't think you got it. You guys need prayer, and I need prayer too, so let's pray. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, God, I need you. Lord, I cannot do this on my own. Lord, you know, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of your grace. And Lord God, I ask, as I speak, let it not be my words, but yours. Let me not be seen, but you be seen in me. And Lord God, if it's your will, help this to touch someone's life here today. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, today we're going to, well, I'm going to show you how to overcome. We're going to see that we really need Jesus. Secondly, we're going to, um, well, explore the love of God. And lastly, we will discover the last step to overcoming. So let's go into our Bibles to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Lack of time, I'll just read it now, but you guys can still look it up. It's, uh, you know, Romans 3, verse 23, and it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. And sometimes we go through our day thinking that we're pretty good. Sometimes we are like, we say, yeah, I'm I have some problems, but I'm not as bad as that person who does whatever it is. But, you know, Romans states something very clearly. And that's in the first part of chapter 6, verse 23, which says, For the wages of sin is death. Friends, no matter how small your sin may look like, it is still sin. You know, Around four years ago, I was helping to, like, make, like, smooth the wall of a bathroom. And so, for that, you know, in, in Mexico, I was doing that. And so, over there, we use like, concrete blocks, like tabique. And so, we put them, you know, we stack them up, whatever. And then, so they can be painted easier and, you know, make them smoother, we put, like, cement mud. And so as I was bringing the cement uh, mix into the upstairs inside, because it was outside that we were doing the mix, um, my mom told me something that, well, she told me that to not get that much, you know, cement in a bucket, not carry that much. But, you know, I disobeyed trying to you know, impress some girls, whatever. <laughs> and so, and guess what? Where we are today, I have back problems, 
And yeah, not a good end. <laughs> you know, sometimes we look at things that we look at things that we think they're small and we don't think they're that bad just and we do them just to impress someone, just to fit in, or just for whatever reason. Maybe out of rebellion, out of the teacher that you don't really like. But guess what? It is still sin. And do you guys remember what the Bible says of the wages of sin is? Yes, it's death, friends. Steps to Christ, paragraph 3, um, page 30 says, God does not regard all sin as equal magnitude. There are degrees of guilt and his estimation as well as that of men. However trifling this or that wrong may seem in the eyes of men, no sin is small in the sight of God. Men's judgment is partial, imperfect, but God estimates all things as they really are. The drunkard is despised and is told that his sin will exclude him from heaven. While pride, selfishness, and covetousness go often, too often go unrebuked. These sins are especially offensive to God. They are contrary to the benevolence of his character, to the unselfish love which is the very atmosphere, which is the very atmosphere of the unfallen universe. He who falls into some of these grosser sins may sense a shame and poverty and his need and the grace of God. But pride feels no need. And so he closes his heart against Christ and his infinite blessing he came to save. You know, this is a sobering thought because, you know, looking through my personal life, I know I have struggled with some pride. And I mean, have you guys ever been prideful? Don't answer. But I mean, and as well, like small other sins, like, you know, coveting. Sometimes, like nowadays, how is that wrong? Like, why? I, I like that, you know, shoe, whatever, you know, I'm going to get it or whatever. That's, you know, coveting pretty much. And that's looked as not as a sin. You know, we don't need to only just covet like material things. Sometimes we covet stuff like reputation, social status, and like maybe even talents. But guess what? All of that is still sin. You know, all these supposedly small sins, which cause, which they cause that, uh, Christ to die in our stead. We so often think that we're fine, but we don't realize that we're wretched. We're miserable and poor and blind and naked. We need Jesus. And, you know, wretched doesn't really fit the name for us. It's really supposed to be something worse than that. Each time we have a prideful attitude or say something like a word unkind to someone, it's hurting Jesus. Each time we do these small things that seem so trivial, to us, we are like saying, I don't care all that you had to suffer so that I can be free. I don't want your salvation. You know, no matter your sin, small, big, you're pretty much saying to the one who lived on the worst possible condition, who fasted 40 days and 40 nights, who preached love to the ones who um, killed him, He was whipped, bruised, spat upon, laughed at. For what? To save you. You know, let's go to our Bibles, to Isaiah 53, starting in verse 3. I would like you guys to follow me um, as I read the Word of God and think on these words. Isaiah chapter 53, starting in verse 3. Three, and when you're there, please say amen. All right. Well, now verse 3 says, He was despised, rejected of men, men of sorrows, acquainted with grief. 
and we hid, he, um, we hide as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he bore our griefs, he carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him, smitten, stricken by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we will hear. Can you imagine that? You know, Jesus passed through all that to save you and me. You know, God came to this world so we don't have to be worthless anymore, so we can actually have a purpose to live. You know, there are so many um, verses of the love of God. Like, for example, Jeremiah 31, verse 3, which says, The Lord hath appeared to me of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. And then the famous John 3, 16, you know, everybody can say it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, I remember in LTJ, one of the most thought-provoking quotes that I heard was the one in chapter called Calvary. And you know, those who know it can say it with me. It says, the spotless Son of God, Son upon the cross, his flesh <laughs> lacerated with stripes, those hands who so often reach out in blessing, nailed to the wooden bars, those feet who so tirelessly on ministries of love, spike to the tree, that royal head pierced by the crown of thorns, those quivering lips shaped into the cry of woe, and all that he endured, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, his feet, the agony that racked his frame, and the unutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face, speaks to each child of humanity, declaring, it is for thee that the Son of God consents to bear the burden of guilt. For thee he spoils the domain of death and opens the gates of paradise. He who stilled the angry waves, walked the foam cap billows, who made the devil tremble and deceased flee, who opened blind eyes and called forth the dead to life, offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice. And this for love to thee. He, the sin bearer, endured the wrath of divine justice and become sin for us, himself for us. You know, did you guys catch that? You know, he did all this and is doing everything for us and why? Because he loves us. You know, now we know that we're nothing, you know, yet God came into this dark, sinful place in our stead. We do not have to be sinners and die in sin. So out of love, he came and died so that we could live. But what is the matter then? Why are so many of us still struggling with habits, with temptations and like different things that we're trying to overcome and yet it does not happen? You know, there's a vital step in overcoming and that is repentance. But what is true repentance? So in the book, uh, Steps to Christ, it clearly states what it is. Steps to Christ. Um, on the chapter called Repentance, says there are many who fail to understand the true repent nature of repentance. Multitudes sorrow for that, for they have sinned and even make an outward reformation because they fear that their wrongdoing will bring suffering upon themselves. But this is not repentance in the Bible sense. They lament the suffering rather than the sin. And then skipping a paragraph, I'm going to the next one, says, the prayer of David after his fall illustrates the true nature of sorrow for sin. His repentance was sincere, deep, and there was no effort and prelate of guilt or desire to escape the judgment threatened. And 
inspired his prayer. And you know, Esau and Judas did not have that repentance. They were repented because of their consequence, but not because they were hurting Jesus. And it continues to say, David, however, saw the enormity of his transgression. He saw the defilement of his soul. He loathed his sin. And it was not for pardon only that he prayed, but for purity of heart he longed for the joy of holiness. You know, a lot of us are, have that wrong definition of repentance that we think and, you know, true repentance is a sorrow for sin, not because of the consequence that it brings. The hard thing, well, it's easy to say that, you know, I'm repented because I'm going to, you know, it's easy to be repented, like supposedly, because there's going to be a consequence. But it's a different thing to be repented because of sin. You know, the reason I said it was a vital step in overcoming, you know, as I was doing family worship with my mom, my mom showed me this quote, and it is in Desire of Ages, page 176, paragraph 5, which it says, The light shining from the cross reveals the love of God. His love is drawing us unto him. If we do not resist his drawing, we shall be led to the foot of the cross, in repentance for the sin we have crucified the Savior then the Spirit of God through faith produces a new life in the soul the thoughts and desires are brought into obedience to the will of God then the heart the mind are created anew in the image of him who works us to subdue all things to himself then the love of God is written in the mind and heart and we can say I delight to do thy will, oh my God. And I was praying sometime not too long ago, oh God, please give me the will to do, well, the will and to do of his own pleasure, you know, but I didn't realize what this quote said, that first, to get to that state, you need to be truly repentant. And so that's why I showed you that and then we can experience what Paul said that in Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live um, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's not Christ living anymore, but it's, well, it's not me living anymore, it's Christ. You know, of course, as well, we need faith as we pray. You know, I, when I was around like 10, we lived in, in Virginia where in, we attended this church where there was like two, well, a pair of twins. And so these two guys. And so we would like to, you know, run and race them. And once, I don't remember if it was my idea or my sister's, but we decided to do something. We decided to pray in faith and act upon it. So we prayed and asked God, Lord, please help us, you know, to be able to beat them. And we didn't like, well, you know, when, not to like beat them because we were friends and it was not to like, oh yeah, I'm better than you or whatever. And so we're just going to test this out. And so, and we did our part of practicing. So the next time we saw them, we went and, you know, and like, hey, you know, you want to race? And so <laughs> we went and we called our thing Rock Park. Very cringy, don't ever. Yeah. Anyways, but I guess it makes a point. And so we ran, and it's incredible because my sister's not that fast of a runner. And so these guys were pretty fast. And so by God's grace, we were able to, you know, beat them. And I'm not here to promote competition or anything, but I'm just here to make a point that, you know, that we, when we pray, we need to have faith and act upon it. You know, it's like the, the uh, quote as well in Desire of Ages. I'll just read the last part really quick where it says that when we come to him in faith, 
Every petition enters the heart of God. When we have asked for his blessing, we should believe that we received him and thank him that we have received it. Then we should go about our duties assured that the blessing will be realized when we need it most. When we have learned to do this, we shall know that our prayers are answered. God will do for us exceeding abundantly according to the riches of his glory and the working of his mighty power. You know, this is an essential you know, point to overcoming. Pray with faith. So how do we overcome? We need to look to Jesus. And by looking to Jesus, we see our need and our deep need of his grace. Then we, with that will bring us to tr true repentance and asking in faith we can overcome. But, you know, a lot of times we just cling to our temptations. We just cling to our sins. But friends, the Bible states clearly in James 4:14, 4, whereas ye know not uh, what shall be of the morrow. For what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanish away. And, you know, this should wake us up. If this doesn't, I don't know what will. You know, we have no time to waste. There is no middle ground. We need to choose God we, or, you know, Satan. You know, remember the guy that I was telling you in the beginning that had a struggle with an addiction and he just kept on clinging to the sin? You know, that guy was me. And God has helped me to overcome. And he can help each one of you guys. God is knocking on the hearts of our doors. Will we let him come in? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, we come to you. Lord, we realize that we're nothing. Lord, we really need you. Lord, we give our temptations. Lord, we give everything. Help us not to keep trying to hold the sin that we cherish any longer, Lord, because that is not going to take us anywhere other than death, oh God. Help us to choose you who have loved us so much and has been all your life trying to do the best for us, oh God. Lord, help us to choose you. Help us as we leave here, help us not to be like, oh yeah, that might have been a, you know, a good speech, but help us to actually, Lord, give our life to you. Help us not to be playing around anymore. Help us, oh God. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.